settled on the principles of human rights philosophy. All the animal rights philosophers start with human rights, and then they take a small part of it and apply it to other animals where it's relevant, which goes back to the, the idea that animal rights are the modest idea. It's a very small idea with rather large ramifications, but it's actually a very modest idea. It's just the idea of extending some very basic rights over the species barrier. In fact, there's one theorist who just calls for one right, which is the right not to be property. And he calls just for that one right. Okay. So we're not talking about the idea of trying to figure out a way of applying human rights widely understood to other animals. That's never been on the cards. That's, that's not the deal. That's not, if, if you hear the word and the phrase on rights, it's not the idea that we want human rights for other animals. We want the rights that are relevant to them in terms of who they are. Uh, how do we deal with biases? We challenge them, um, and we we try to. And of course, it's a struggle. It's a, it's a kind of struggle for everybody. But it it needs it needs this kind of event actually. It needs for rational discourse, and that's I suppose one reason why animal rights people might be drawn towards atheists because that's you, you're going to get a rational argument you, you know you're not going to be met with a well god, god told me to and that's the end of the argument anything so in other words we probably feel we've got more common ground here than we would in a, in a lot of other uh, locations so yeah we've all got biases we've all got difficulty we all struggle and what's needed to create our ethical worlds as we see them is great forums of rational discourse, which is what you're all about and what we're all about. So there's a kind of you know, continuity there. Finally, uh, rights and um, is utilitarianism better? Yeah. Leads to leads to the kind of Peter problems. Uh, everything I tend to I tend to favour rights because rights are protections for individuals. So what we tend to what we tend to suggest is, is that rights are a kind of fence around an individual, and on that fence is a sign which says no trespass. Um, and so, in that sense, rights are an individual thing, and um, oft often we'll, we'll bring animal rights advocates into maybe conflict with uh, conservationists who might think, you know, in terms of, of, of species. Um, it does raise the question of of where do we get our rights, and I don't know whether if that's where you're, you're getting on, because obviously you mentioned natural rights, so there are different theories about rights, and obviously this idea that we, our rights are God-given, well that obviously will be a, an issue within this meeting. The modern way of thinking about rights is that they are, as you suggested actually, I think, social constructs. So essentially, rights are ideas which we then defend through rational argument and then codify into law. So in, in a sense, rights are the same as a speed limit. They don't exist in nature. Yeah, so from this point of view, as social constructs, I think we'd be kind of on the same page in the sense of what we would claim to, to want, we, we would defend through rational argument and then try to get societal yeah. agreement. Yeah, that, those kind of things. You've got a question. Uh, yeah, the, the, the same question sort of touched on the, uh, the presence of dogmatic post-Christian ideas um, in the sort of atheism, uh, veganism thing. Um, I thought about that there while Roger was giving his, his answers there. And to me, um, religion is a product of, of humans rather than from God or the divine. I'm sure we're on that here. Um, there was recent research that showed humans have been eating, or human, proto-humans and such, have been eating meat for a million years or so. Um, so the, the eating of meat came long before any sort of Christianity and long before any of that became uh, in any way prevalent in Ireland and things. And so the impact of that on eating meat I don't think is, um, is really substantial. I think the fact that people eat meat is what made it become a feature of religion, rather than religion dictating that people eat meat. The protein value and the concentration of food, which has enabled society to develop and become more complex, 
Yeah. If we were, if we were like a lot of species just grasping for a living and barely breaking even, we wouldn't have the time to develop our big brains and our, our big society. Yeah, this is. So, so before I answer, like, can we go to maybe last points? Okay. Make, make this, make this your this closing is comments, whatever else you want to add that you have to okay, say. Yeah. yeah, well, I think, I mean, that is actually called the big brains theory on that, that we, re, you know, we require animal proteins to, to, to develop our big primate uh, brains. Obviously, it's a very controversial idea. I actually didn't say that, or Okay, sorry. I said we're more efficient to have Time to do other things. If we had less profit, we'd have less time to do other things. Oh, okay, well that's that, that's quite interesting. I mean that 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 would bring that would bring me to someone like Gerard um, Diamond, uh, and he's got a really interesting book which is called The Rise and Fall of the Third Chimpanzee, and um, it it kind of taps into I think the sentiment behind the point, um, and about certainly about time because. When we think about what are often called hunter-gatherer tribes, which is a phrase that I don't like, because you know quantitatively it should be gatherer-hunter, and the modern phrase is forager. If we think about forager tribes, we tend to think of them as kind of scratching around. You know, it's it's a hand-to-mouth kind of existence, and it's a struggle on a daily basis. We we tend to, from our kind of developed uh, position think about that as undevelopment and a subsistence and difficulty. What it turns out from his point of view was that when you, when you look at that, it turns out that in terms of the work that that society was doing, they were working for something like 15 hours a week, you know, in, by ca characterizing what they were doing to, to create their, their protein. So they, they, had, they had kind of plenty of time. Uh, for leisure, for social things, and for development. So I think the point that you make is it's something that a lot of people who are kind of supportive of the kind of Paleolithic kind of diet kind of thing, these claims are, uh, are coming through quite uh, frequently now. I, I think the evidential, you know, the weight of evidence behind it is very, very weak, or at least certainly controversial. And it even goes back to issues like uh, anthropology, where when, when, when male anthropologists went out and investigated the primitive tribes and this kind of stuff, whenever they found anything sharp, it had to be a weapon. Yeah. When feminist-inspired anthropologists followed them, they, when they found anything sharp, they thought, well, well, couldn't that be a scraping tool? Couldn't that be something, something else? And so there was that kind of gender issue there, but that feeds into these arguments. And so... The diet of early humanity is unknown, and there's lots of specu speculation about it. Going, going back to your, I mean, this is an interesting issue, probably where I might finish on really, is, you know, you talk about the eating of meat, and, you know, you made that kind of joke about carnivores everywhere, and you'd probably identify yourself as an omnivore. Yeah. Right. Now... So I try to eat as little vegetables as possible. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Usually, I think, culturally, when we hear the word omnivore, we seem to have this feeling that it's a kind of 50-50 kind of thing. <coughs> Go, going, back, going back to the primitive or the early, to use those kind of fr phrases, uh, uh, early humanity, when it was foragers, the amount of meat in the human diet is thought to have been incredibly small. And one reason for that is because rather than the school books showing us bringing down the mammoths with the spears, in reality, early humanity were probably scavengers, which on an ideological level, we don't like that idea. We much prefer the storybook image than the idea that we would follow the lion or the hyena to a kill. Yeah. And also you had an issue as when a tribe would be going through an area, because it nomadic tribes, no agriculture, they would probably come across some of the dead uh, uh, animals, and so they would probably be incorporated into the diet as well. But we're talking about low levels of meat, certainly much lower than the kind of standard American diet or standard Western diet that we, we've got now, which is associated with all kinds of illnesses. 
uh, because we're, you know, in general terms, society is eating far too much animal pro pro produce. So I think it's controversial to, to, to claim that animal produce have, has given us many benefits at all. Well, I think the evidence is that it was fairly low, and I think the reason for that is probably issues like um, hygiene. Um, so it's um, not necessarily nutrition, possibly was a contributing. Well, yeah, it, it could be in there, but what what, I, what I'm saying is, is that th these these issues are unresolved, you know, and like a lot of people like to make a lot of claims about it. What what Reagan would actually say though is, whatever the truth was about that, it doesn't it doesn't dictate what we do now.